Uh, welcome everyone. Today is Saturday, uh, May 7, 2022. And um, uh, it is, uh, some, it's this, my company is Somatics for You, and this is uh, my monthly uh, Somatics and Anatomy class. I'm going to go to introduce our theme and topic for today. I'm going to go right into screen share and I'll go back and forth a little bit. And today our topic is horizontal bands in the body's myofascia. And you might go, oh, what the heck is that? And um, this is a, uh, I have to minimize something. Okay, let's see, where do I do that? Let's see if I can do it this way. Well, now I can't see anybody. Um, all right, I might live with this, I might not. Um, so horizontal bands, this is really, I find interesting. This is a relatively new area of study for me, or when I say study, it's a combination of doing some reading, which is not that easy to find on it, but I'm gonna give you a great reference. And also just thinking somatically, how I would uh, create movement and awareness through these horizontal bands. So let me just uh, briefly go to uh, what horizontal bands are, and then we'll come back to this picture a number of times. And I'll read the words that might be very small in your screen. But what are horizontal bands? They are local horizontal bands or straps within the body's myofascia. Myo is muscle and fascia is our connective tissue matrix in which we're embodied, enveloped and intertwined with everywhere. And these um, local horizontal bands, they act somewhat like retinacula. So I'll define retinacula and then I've got some pictures so that you kind of understand what they are. Like the retinacula, at the ankle and wrist. They are thickenings in the various layers of muscle and fascia, including the fat layer of loose connective tissue under the skin. So this is an ankle retinacula. This is a wrist retinacula. Uh, there are various retinaculas in the body. They are thickenings in the fascia. Now, Anatomists had to cut away a lot of fascia to make it look like it was just a clean strap. They are just within the whole embedding of the fascia, but they are thicker areas. They are thicker areas and they strap in or hold in tendons and various structure, structure, uh, structures. And um, these bands have a kind of similar effect. They are areas of restriction horizontally through the body. They show up superficially as a flattening or depression running horizontally through the body surface and affect fat deposition. So when you think of your own body naked in front of a mirror, whatever that is, you just have these various fat deposits. So I was looking, I've been looking at my own naked body, not that pleasant anymore, but I clear, I, it's like, oh my God, there's that band. Oh, there's that band. Oh, there's that band. And so for example, on some people, this band might be very tight. This band might be very tight. This band might be hard to see, which is fine. And then the belly sticks out because the belly and the belly fat have to bulge between the restrictive bands that are there. So fat de deposition is somewhat shaped by where our restrictive bands are. Anyway, these bands have no traditional anatomical connections on the body surface or three-dimensionally through the body. They are most visible when looking at a naked body. They also show up in cadaver dissections. So when you look at your naked body or you look at others' naked bodies, you, and you now know about these horizontal bands, take a closer look because where you see these sort of constricted horizontal lines, whether they're continuous or discontinuous, those are these horizontal bands and they can be continuous or discontinuous. 
Um, many body workers have noticed these hor horizontal bands and commented on them. And in, as more and more uh, people have gotten into dissection, especially people in the um, anatomical and movement world, they've noticed these horizontal bands in their clients. Sometimes even if they wear clothes, you can feel the bands. This book, I'll, I'll show this book when I come out of screen share, I'll show that again. Um, anyway, uh, let me go back. These, these bands are somewhat variable in their exact positioning and in their degree of binding or tension. So let me come, I'm gonna end up on this one. Let me stop my screen share for a moment. So I, I first was introduced a long time ago actually to horizontal bands in uh, one of the anatomy trains book. This is a, a fourth edition. So it was, could even been years ago, many years ago in the first edition. And there was a very short chapter on these horizontal bands. And I thought, oh, that's so interesting. And I kind of tucked it in the back of my mind, but I didn't, um, I didn't really, uh, a lot of other things was going on. I was learning Hannah somatics or whatever, and I didn't pay much attention, but it stuck in my mind that this was such an interesting concept. And then um, Tom, Thomas Myers was introduced to the concept of horizontal bands through uh, R. Lewis Schultz, PhD. And then, then, then I went and got this book at a certain point and put it on a shelf and didn't really, again, pay much attention to it. And then I came across, I was looking through Tom Myers' book again, I came across the horizontal bands and I thought, I have that book. And I went and I went on my shelf and sure enough, there it was, The Endless Web, uh, Fascial Anatomy and Physical Reality um, by uh, R. Lewis Schultz, PhD and Rosemary Phytus D.O. And it's very interesting. And he has a lot of information on the horizontal bands in this book. And um, that's where I learned it was in this book is where I learned that anatomists, especially anatomists coming out of body work and movement, uh, when they got into anatomy, they kept feeling the thickness, these, these thick impediments, these horizontal thick impediments in the myofascia as they were doing their dissection. And same with this guy. This guy really, not only in his bodywork practice, but in his dissections, kept thinking, here are those horizontal bands. They're really there. Um, Ida Rolf noticed them a long time ago. People don't realize um, how old Red Ida Rolf is. Ida Rolf, I mean, she's been dead for a long time, but she got her PhD in chemistry in something like 1928. I mean, she was an, had an incredible life. She noticed these bands too. Anyway, we're going to go back to screen share and we're going to look at these bands. And a little bit more closely. So there's an I band, an I band, and it comes, it's, these bands can be continuous or discontinuous, remember, and it comes all the way around. And in the back, it's back point is on what's called the lambdoidal suture. This is the lambdoidal suture. This is the sagittal suture. If you touch the back of your head, you'll feel the back of your, the back of your head, there's a, it becomes more bumpy, a big bump back here. That top of the bump is right here. And this eye, eye band not only crosses the eyes, the eye sockets, the bridge of the nose, the temples, the temples, but it, it, it comes right to this point. Then there is a chin band. The chin band is somewhat variable. It can be, it can come across the mouth. It can come across the jaw. It comes back down, usually a little under the ear to the mastoid process of the temporal bone. And its end point is where the occiput meets the top cervical vertebrae, which is the um, atlas. So that's its end point. And you can obviously see these, these bands interweave and bleed into each other. Um, anyway, let me, 
let me not get too distracted. There's so much interesting information, I think. This is the collar band. This is the collar band and it follows the clavicles and it comes across the tops of the shoulders, across the tops of the scapulas and it ends at the junction. All these bands end at important junctions along either along the spine or along the whole vertical axis going to the crown of the head. So the collar band ends uh, or is it, its point on the spine is at the junction of the lowest cervical C7 and the highest thoracic T1. And then there is the chest or nipple band, the chest or nipple band. Everybody has this band. Most people have most of these bands whether continuous or discontinuous, this is the most prominent band that people can see. You can often see this through clothing as well. And it's right about the level of the nipples and it goes around and it's the lower part of the um, armpit. And it comes around to this point right here, T6, T5, 6 or 7, it's called the dorsal hinge. It's called the dorsal hinge. It was first recognized and named by Ida Rolf because she noticed that there was a change as the vertebrae, as you go up or down the vertebral column, the vertebrae change in their shape and how they rest on other vertebrae. Even there could be a change in the discs. And those changes represent changes in size, shape, and ranges of motion. And she noticed a distinct change in this area. It's kind of between the shoulder blades, maybe a little bit lower on most of us, maybe halfway or a little bit lower. And if you've ever had anybody in body work bring their hands, you're lying on the table supine on your back and they bring their hands underneath in the center between your shoulder blades and the spine right along here. And they just gently push you up. You kind of go, oh, it feels so good. That's the dorsal hinge. Then we have the third band, the navel or umbilical band, umbilical after umbilical cord. Navel, if you don't know the word umbilical, I'll try to say umbilical and navel. This is the most variable band. It really can be quite a bit lower to all the way to the edges of the uh, lower ribs. So it can be, it's kind of the general area of most of the somatic center or a lot of the somatic center. And in the back, it goes up. It's hard to see how far up it goes, but its point is at the junction of the lower thoracic and highest lumbar point. And then we have the inguinal band, and I don't know any other name to give it, but I will show you a picture of the inguinal band, which is named after this ligament here, goes from the pubic bone to the hip pointer, the ASIS, anterior superior iliac spine, which is the point of the ilium bone in the front, the hip pointer, and the oblique muscles, uh, uh, one of the areas they attach into is the inguinal band. And in fact, their attachment into the band helps form the band. And there's one on each side. So this inguinal band comes down to about, if this, if this is the navel, this is the pubic, this is the lowest band, the pubic band. The bottom of the inguinal band is one to two inches or so above the, the pubic bones. And it's basically between the navel and the pubic bone at its lowest part. Many of us have a distinct band here and our belly hangs over it. And then it comes up the inguinal ligament and over the iliac crest, the crest of the ilium. And its point is the junction of um, the lumbar vertebrae, lumbar five, and the sacrum, the lumbosacral junction down here. A little bit, we think of our waist, it's a, like an inch below the waist is actually where the lumbar come down and rest on the sacrum. And then we have, um, oh, I want to say about this, um, back up to the navel for a moment. Navel umbilical, sometimes it's called the solar plexus band because it can go that high. And I also sometimes call it the somatic center band. It's a real variable band. It's a big area. 
okay, then the inguinal band, and then the lowest band is the pubic band across the pubic bones. This area would be like the groin right near the genitals. And this area goes along where the top of the thigh meets the lowest abdominal area. It goes all the way around the upper leg, the upper thigh. We all have this band to some degree. And it comes down along the gluteal fold, the fold at the bottom of the buttocks, and its attachment point or its, um, its meeting point from the two sides is the bottom of the sacrum and the top of the tailbone. There is a junction here, and it is many people keep this junction movable all their life, and many people don't. Um, so between the sacrum and the coccyx, the sacrum and the tailbone. So those are the bands. I just want to uh, point out a couple of other things. Um, you know, obviously, in my opinion, you know, we want to be flexible, mobile, comfortable, strong, have good upright posture, be able to do what we want to do in life. These horizontal bands can be very restrictive. And so they're interesting. We tend to orient to the verticals in our body, lines of longitude, just like our planet Earth. Long spine and trunk, balanced head on neck, long verticals, arms, straight arms down, straight legs down, verticals. We visualize our, muscula our musculature more in verticals and sometimes in diagonals and spirals, but still the spiral or the diagonal is capable, of course it can contract, but it's capable of length, of longness. It's got a more up and down orientation. Some of us already recognize some horizontals like the respiratory diaphragm, which would be part of the respiratory diaphragm. Come on, whoops. Oh, I know I have to be out of this. Uh, the, here's the respiratory diaphragm would be connected to the chest band. Remember the diaphragm comes very high up along the ribs and the um, navel or, or um, umbilical band uh, because this umbilical band, navel band can come quite high. So this, um, so this uh, respiratory diaphragm, well, let me find out where I am, can, is part of, of, the, of the, the chest band bleeding down into the navel band. Uh, we also sometimes, uh, we think of the pelvic floor, the pelvic diaphragm as a horizontal, uh, the diaphragm, a series of muscles that uh, cross, here's the tailbone, the coccyx, here's the pubic, symphysis and the pubic joints to the pubic bones. And here's the sits bones, the sits bones, this is the hip socket. And <clears throat> so that's another place of a horizontalness in our body. And sometimes you think of the, of the, of the um, yoke of the neck. If you, I don't know if you can see this little picture here, but if you put your thumbs and your index fingers together, that is, that is as big as your first rib is going around your neck. It's a very small area. It's kind of like a yoke and many people have likened it to another form of horizontal band, which is true. Most of us haven't known or thought about horizontal banding, lines of latitude, and their effect on restricting our movement, compressing and shortening our statue, stature, and gluing our tissues to each other or bones, thereby preventing us from attaining our full upright length, broadness, and fullness. Hopefully this class, and it's going to carry on, this is going to be one or two additional classes to get through all the material. This class will add to our awareness how we can sense, feel, and free up areas of congestion and limitation, especially where tightly bound horizontally oriented bands meet our vertically oriented muscles, bones, and fascia. Um, just, I... I know time goes on, but I felt I wanted to orient you to these bands. If you want to know more about fascia one, you can look at Wikipedia. It's huge. But the uh, people that did Body Worlds have now done Freya, which is the, the um, organization and um, anatomical dissection of all the layers of fascia. And there's a whole slideshow on this on YouTube. 
and just fascia is everywhere. Here's our more thin uh, superficial uh, sheath of fascia. Here's, this looks like maybe a leg. This might be the vastus lateralis, the lateral quad and some fascia over it. But all these lines, these are all fascial coverings. They cover everything, every nerve, every blood vessel, every muscle fiber, every bundle of muscle fibers, every bundle of bundle of bundles of muscle fibers, every muscle, every region, everything is wrapped in layers and layers of fascia. Fascia is connected through these little horizontal strands that can get very thick. This is a thickening of this. This is pretty easy and slippy and slidey. This is more gluey. Anyway, that's a whole different discussion. People have looked at these seven bands and said, oh, well, that looks like that could be the seven chakras, or it could be the seven chakras and the endocrine glands, or it could be myofascial meridians or non Narnia meridians and all kinds of, of things. And we're not gonna go into that, but people have written about this and, and coordinated. And I find that extremely interesting. Um, just a couple of things before we start going into the different bands. Um, actually, I think we'll actually, well, um, I, I can always come back to this. Let me stop the share. We're going to start with the first band, which is the eye band. It's kind of like you're a raccoon over the bridge of the nose, through the eyeballs, around the sockets of the eyes, across your temples, across to the big, the biggest bump that's most posterior in, in the back of your head. And just take your fingers and just palpate you can feel the ridge of your eye socket really easily. This is the ridge of your eye socket. You can do the upper ridge of the eye socket in acupuncture, uh, acu well, acupressure, if you've had any acupressure, which are based on acupuncture points, you can actually kind of press up into the rim and you can actually relax your eyes by pressing acupressure points all along the rim of the eyes. You, there's acupressure points all through the temples or you know how sometimes you just get a sort of a headache or your eyes, head get tired and you just massage your temples. It feels so good. You can massage through the temporalis bone. Just take your fingers and massage through the temporalis bone all the way to the back. Let's just, there's a lot of material and in future classes, we'll come back to each band in different ways, but let's just do uh, one pandiculation or maybe two. And that's, for example, of the eyes, you can gently, gently squeeze your eyes together. These are circular muscles and then slowly release. I find it very hard to release slowly. And again, gently squeeze the eyes obicularis oculi, slowly try to slowly open. They're so, it's, these muscles are so reflexive. It's, I find it very hard to control a slow release. You can open your eyes with or without your forehead. You can open your eyes and slowly release if you can. Once again, open your eyes, slow controlled release. And just take a moment to see if, well, one, it ha probably highlighted your eye band, but you may feel a little bit different. You may be broader, more highlighted in this area. I do, even teaching, I can, I can feel that. And then we're gonna come down to the chin band. And again, the chin band, if you just take your fingers and you pinch a little bit, Along, you can feel the uh, bottom of the max of the uh, mandible. You can pinch the chin. You can come all the way back to the angle of the jaw. But this band also can cover the lips and the jaw. Comes right through, like the masseter muscle. Usually goes. They describe it as going a little below the ear, whereas the eye band comes a little above the ear. The chin band comes a little below the ear and it comes back along uh, under your uh, right connects with your mastoid process where your sternocleidomastoid attaches. 
and it comes all the way back. If you follow with your fingers, follow the shelf of your occiput bone, the occipital ridge, the top of the cervical area, the bottom of the occiput bone right on the shelf. And uh, just, it feels really good to rub and massage, right? So you're kind of going down onto the top of the cervical spine up into the occipital ridge and you're kind of going back and forth. It feels good in there. And the connection is the occiput rocking on the um, atlas. And if you bring your fingers back there, I'm half on occiput, half on my neck, and you very gently, we can pendiculate the suboccipital muscles, the muscles that attach the occiput to the atlas and, ax and axis, which is a C2. You can just very gently nod backward. These are small movements and then very gently nod back to neutral following with your load from your fingers, just very gentle load back to neutral. Again, pendiculate, gently nod backward. You're con gently contracting suboccipital muscles. Your fingers might be offering a little bit of load and then slowly let your face come back to neutral. Your neck will lengthen. You're following your skull <clears throat> with the, your fingers. And so that the suboccipital muscles, occipital ridge, that's part of this chin jaw band. Now you can understand how these, these bands bleed and intertwine between the eye band and the jaw band, we have basically our face. So all the muscles um, uh, of uh, facial expression, all the expressions we work with our face is very unconscious as we're talking with people or doing different things. They all live be from the mostly from the eye band, some go a little higher to the chin band, and our senses, our sense of sight and hearing and smelling and tasting, that all happens between these bands. We're mostly very unconscious of how tight and how um, how we use and have created these bands of tension in, in ourselves. Let me just take a, a I think we're, I want to now get down on the floor, um, but I'll pick up things as we continue in classes. Before we lie down on the floor, I just want you to know what we're going to be doing because we're going to be coming down into the collar band, which is following the clavicles or collar bones. So here's your chin band, here's your collar band. You got your whole neck in between those bands. There's, there's a lot going on in how the tension bleeds from the chin band or the jaw band, however you wanna call it, down into the collar band and the tension from the collar band coming up. So the tension in each band can bleed up and bleed down. And in fact, because of fascia, there's a biotense, we are biotensegratus, which means everything we do reconfigures the whole system all the time. Okay, but uh, what I wanted to say is we're going to be, if like this is my right clavicle, we're going to be when we lie down, I'm going to grasp, at one point, I'm going to tell you to ask you to grasp it, to grasp it between your fingers as we do a certain rotary movement. So you can feel how much the clavicles move and should move um, and how we stiffen this area so much they may not move. So I just, I will describe it again, but I wanted to kind of show you. Before we do that, um, let me go back to screen share for just one moment and just review. Okay, share. Just review. Um, we're gonna start lying down. I will have you palpate as best you can. I'll describe, we'll start with the collar band and then we'll go to the chest band. We'll come down to the navel or umbilical band. Each one I'll describe the location, we'll palpate it, we'll do various things with it. Um, the inguinal band and the pubic band. I just want you to look at the collar and the chest band for a moment. 
the collar and the chest band. So here's the collar band. Now, this is the nipple line. This is the chest band. This is your pectoralis major. Your pectoralis major does not end down at the bottom of your, of your ribs. It ends at about the nipple line. And the rectus abdominis, it's covered in its fascial sheath, but this is all rectus abdominis, comes right up to the nipple line and the bottom of the pectoralis major and the top of the rectus abdominis. There's a right and a left. Um, they meet at the nipple line. This is the most prominent line in people. Everybody has it. So a lot is going on between the uh, chest nipple line and the collar line. And I just want to point out that between the collar line and the chin jaw line, we've got all these muscles of the neck. And we'll do some things with those muscles as time permits. So let me just, uh, let me just see if I want to say anything else. Uh, we can just look at this for a moment. Here's where your, uh, pubic, uh, where your pubic disc is. And there's a joint on this side of the disc and a joint on the other side of the disc. And it allows this complete hemipelvis and leg to be able to swing and walk. For, like in walking, one leg is forward. Well, it's one leg and hemipelvis swings forward. The other hemipelvis and leg swing backward. This joint is not a voluntary joint, but it is a highly movable joint. And most books say it's hardly movable at all. And that is incorrect. And this seems a little far apart, but here's where your sacrum lies. Here's where your sacrum lies. Your sacrum is the bottom, sacrum and coccyx are the bottom of the spine. Whereas the pubic disc and pubic movement go more with the whole limb but there's a relationship between the pubic joints and the sacroiliac joints. Okay. Um, okay, I think, that's, I think that's good for now. And uh, I'm gonna come out of screen share and please make your way to the floor. Set your, we'll start in supine. You can set your pad up. I can't really see but just a very few people. Um, and when I start talking, I'm not really aware of chat. I'm not aware of much. And it just feels like ooh, time goes on, but I'm not gonna rush it. We're just gonna go with more classes. Um, you wanna lie down in a position of comfort, support under your head. I recommend support under your head so you don't tip your head backward. And it's up to you, knees bent, knees long, support under your knees, that's up to you because we're um, going to really dive in. So just take a moment to feel yourself on the floor at the end of class. When we take a moment at the end of class before we come up, we're, we wanna go and we wanna see how long do I feel? How full does my back feel against the floor, my shoulders and the center of my back and coming down my low back, is it on the floor, not on the floor? You're just taking, becoming aware. How about the full, fullness of your buttocks and pelvis on the floor? And just your general sort of sense of length, but you also have sense of, uh, sense of length for your legs, from the tops of your thighs to your knees, from your knees to your ankles and heels, whether your knees are bent or straight, you've got lines of length. Your feet, whether they're a flat on the whether they're flat on the floor because your knees are bent or just out, from your heels to your toes, there's length. You've got length coming up your forelegs to your knees, lengths between your knees and your thighs on the top length of the whole front of your body. We want to be long in stature, long in the back, long in the front between our pubic bone and our chin, but even all the way to the crown of our head, we want to be long. So just take an impression 
of your length. And then your arms, let your arms notice your length, length from the shoulders to the elbows, length from the elbows to your fingertips. Okay, let's go to the collar band and let's palpate it. Find your clavicles, your, your collar bones. And just, I'm putting my right hand on my right clavicle, my left hand on my left clavicle. I'm starting close into the midline where there's a little divot where the medial ends of your uh, clavicles, your collarbones um, don't quite come together. There's a divot, but they connect with the sternum or breastbone. And then you can maybe gently palpate it, or sometimes I like to do one side at a time and cross my right hand over to my left collarbone or vice versa. It's up to you. You're just getting a sense of one or both of your collarbones. It's kind of an S-shaped bone. Sometimes you'll feel a thickening in the middle of the bone. If you've broken your collarbone, you'll feel the scarring. And it comes out, the, the lateral end of the clavicles uh, come and meet the acromion process of the scapula. There's a little step down onto the tip of the, of the shoulder. And, and then you, the, the collarbone comes backward on tops of the scapulas and on top of the shoulder area in general to meet. And if you can, with one of your hands, with the fingers of one of your hands, reach behind your neck and find the bumpy part at the bottom of the neck and the top of the thoracic spine. Find that bumpy part. It's either T1 or C7. Right now, it doesn't matter. And, and gently see if you can put your index finger underneath that bumpiest part and feel the space, sometimes there's no space there, feel the space between that spinous process of the bumpy vertebrae and the next one, and gently nod your head, chin up, chin down, and see if you can, when your chin is down, grow that space, and when your chin is up, feel how it kind of squishes together. Tom Hanna used to come around, put his hands right there on the space between the bumpy vertebrae and the next one. And he would sort of dig his, comfortably dig his finger in there. As we nodded down, he'd nestle his finger more, keep it there. And as we brought our head back to neutral, he would gently pull up on that vertebrae, trying to create some space in the upper thoracic vertebrae. Feels kind of good. I'll never forget that because that we, he guided us to do it or maybe we worked in partners, I can't remember, but I remember the feeling of like, wow. And I had like no space there. And then, not that I have a lot of space now. <laughs> and then come back, let your, let your arm come back down. So that's the collar area. Now, the collar bones are extremely movable. We usually don't even think about them at all. It, I'm gonna take my, it doesn't matter if you, I'm gonna take my left uh, index and thumb and go to my right clavicle, kind of in the center of it and just kind of surround the clavicle as best I can. If you wanna put a pillow under your bent arm or hold your bent arm, that's up to you. But take your, um, we're gonna start with the right clavicle so I can give the direction. So. In fact, you need to do this with your left hand, it, uh, hold the clavicle because your right arm needs to be down close to your body and relaxed. And now we're gonna do a rotary motion with our shoulder girdle, our shoulder joint and the scapula. The center of this movement is within the shoulder joint and the scapula comes along. So just as, we, as I guide you in this movement, feel how movable your shoulder blade is. And if it isn't movable, doing this movement will help to mobilize it. This is an important mobility activity. You're going to roll your arm and shoulder inward, bring it upward towards your head, bring it backward, bring, your, bring it downward, your arm long. Okay, internally rotate, up, externally rotate, down. So your arm is coming along. 
internal rotation, shoulder up, external rotation, and long. And as you kind of come into this rotary motion, in, up, back, down. Feel how movable your clavicle is. Feel how movable it is. Let's go in the and come to rest. We're also by doing this rotary motion, because this collar, collar band bleeds in with the chest nipple band um, and the armpit. We're also, I think of it as cleaning out the shoulder joint the actual shoulder joint, even though your scapula is floating on top of your ribs, I'm talking about inside where the top of the humerus meets the socket, which is the lateral end of the clavicle, of the, um, of the uh, scapula. Okay, so you're sort of cleaning your shoulder joint. You're, you're scraping the junk out and you're letting the fluids come in. All right, let's go the, continue to hold your clavicle, your right clavicle, and let's go the other way. Externally rotate shoulder backward, shoulder up towards your head, internally rotate and down long. External rotation up, internal rotation, arm long and down. And make that rotary mo motion back, up, forward, down. And as you go in a rotary circle, whether you've lost my circle and are, are on your own circle, feel how that clavicle is moving all over the place with this motion. And come to rest and just feel your arm and shoulder and see if you don't feel that your chest and clavicle area on that side has maybe gotten broader, maybe your shoulder, your right shoulder is an upper back are resting more on the on the floor. And now stay with the right arm, bring your right arm out into abduction on the floor. You don't have to abduct it, you know, to full straight, it can be a little less, you want to find it where it's comfortable. But now we're going to do this in abduction with the arm more abducted to open up the armpit because we uh, bring your arm real close, bring your right arm real close to your body and feel how it squeezes your armpit. Bring your arm in. A lot of people walk around with their armpit squoozed. <laughs> bring your arm out. You're airing out those armpits. Get your, get, get, and get some freedom, not only in the shoulder joint, but in the armpit grasp your right clavicle with your left hands again and let's do the let's do the following rotary motion rotate inward which is downward um, rotate inward downward down back up rotate downward which is inward bring your shoulder down bring your arm into external rotation shoulder and arm and bring your shoulder up so now you're doing a rotary motion more on the horizontal of abduction of the arm. But again, feel how movable your, your uh, scapula is. Let's go in the other direction. Externally rotate your arm and shoulder down towards your feet, internal rotation and up. External, down, internal, up. You can, you know, there's different ways you can make these rotary motions. This is just an example and let your arm relax. And it's to feel and to, and to loosen up and to get the clavicle to, to move. Okay, and let your arm relax. Feel a sense of maybe that whole collarbone almost down to the chest, uh, ch chest band shoulder area, armpit area, maybe it feels more open, a little looser, a little bit more full. Okay, let's take our right hand, our right fingers and go to our left clavicle. Now on this side, we're gonna do some of, some of the same things, but we're gonna also do some different things. Go under, right underneath your clavicle. You've got the subclavius muscle, not, the whole way, but a good part of the way. And you're gonna gently uh, palpate and br I'm bringing my um, 
like my middle and ring finger, or maybe you're using your index finger back and forth right under the clavicle. So I feel the bone and I feel the tissue under the bone and I'm traveling medial to lateral. It doesn't really matter, lateral to medial. And sometimes that subclavius gets very thick. And that subclavius, if it's thick and unmovable, it's hard for the clavicle. It's another impediment to the collar band. I just wanted to bring that out. Okay, grasp, we may not have time. Well, grasp your uh, left clavicle with your right fingers. And now let's start rotary motion. Your arm, your left arm is down by your side and long. Rotate your shoulder and arm inward, upward toward the head, backward, external, and down long through the fingers. And then in, up back, down. Your arm will turn and roll as you're moving through your shoulder joint. Your scapula, maybe as you continue this, feel how your scapula is also coming along, floating on your ribs. Let's reverse direction. Let's externally rotate. Let's go down. Let's rotate in, come up towards the head, rotate backward down footward, inward, upward towards head. Get that rotary motion going. And if you want, you can actually bring your fingers to the sternoclavicular joint to the medial end of your clavicle. And you can, you can rotate, my, all of a sudden my arm wanted to go internally again. I think that's my direction of ease and it was freeing up something. Um, you can put your fingers right at the medial end of the clavicle. So you're feeling the sternum and the clavicle and do a rotary motion of any kind and feel that joint. It's a movable joint. And so is the acromioclavicular joint. If you take your palpate your clavicle all the way out, feel where the clavicle kind of steps down onto the acromium. If you can find that junction and maybe the movement will help you find a rotary motion. Now my arm wants to go backward first. Find a rotary motion with your fingers on a chromium and lateral clavicle and feel how movable the acromioclavicular where your clavicle and the top of your shoulder, the acromium come together. The acromium is part of the scapula. And bring your arm into abduction. We'll just do a few rotary motions in abduction and see what your arm wants to do. Does your arm want, there's no right or wrong. It's moving the clavicle and the, and the different joints of the clavicle. So you're going to, there's four movements. Your arm, it can be go inward and up or down, or it can go outward and up or down first. I'm gonna go inward, bring my arm kind of into my body, outward, down. And I'm gonna go in, and I'm just picking a circular direction. My arm is gonna roll and move as my uh, shoulder joint and scapula move. And now I'm gonna reverse that if I can. Ooh, that's harder for me. That's I have more confusion. I need to work a little bit more with doing that opposite movement. And so we learn something about ourselves. Now, where is that coming from? Is that tight muscles? Is that um, collar band and um, breast band, uh, 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 chest nipple band? Is that being tight? It's very, is it tight muscles? You know, all of those can play a role. Let your arm relax and just notice if you feel more highlighted through your, uh, through your clavicle, now your left clavicle, your shoulder joint, maybe your scapula. Do you feel more fullness of your shoulders and upper back on the floor? Is your chest broader? And now I'm feeling the broadness all across my chest. My, I'm, I'm much broader right now in the, in the back, in the front and, excuse me, and in the back. 
and even my neck feels more relaxed. So that's a little bit of movement and highlighting through the collarbone. Okay. Because of time, I want to do something that connects all. I want to do something that goes through all the bands. And in future classes, we'll individualize bands more. We'll just see what, what, what the time is. But let's move into the horizontal band, arch and flatten, arch and curl. Going to start with arch and flatten, which may turn in, I'll tell you, it, which may turn into an arch and curl at some point. So I would start with knees bent, feet on the floor, arms comfortable, maybe not, not super, not super glued against your body, but not too abducted. I just a comfortable place, wherever that is for you, with your arms on the floor. And take your hands, let's palpate the lowest band for a moment, the pubic band. Find, let your fingers find your pubic bone and come, a, start it maybe in the middle and come along the pubic bone. Then you'll hit your thigh. Your pubic bone is in line with your upper thigh. Come across your upper thigh laterally and you'll run into or be very close to your greater trochanters, your pubic line and pubic bones are basically in line with your greater trochanters on the upper sides of your thighs. And then you can either palpate or visualize you're going under each gluteal fold and maybe one hand can come back. If it's comfortable, don't hurt your shoulder. And you're at the joint of the coccyx and sacrum. Well, how do you find that? If you can feel the very bottom tip of your tailbone, go up an inch or two, and you might feel even a little indentation. You may not, but that's the junction of your tailbone and sacrum. And that's the endpoint of the pubic bone. So now come back, on, come back and rest for a moment. All right, now we are going to do a very small, you know how we nod the head just at the very top with the suboccipital muscles between the occiput and the atlas. Now we're going to nod in the lowest band. And it's just as if your, your, your uh, pubic bones are nodding. They're nodding a little bit so that you're you're, you're going, when you inhale, you're going only as far down towards your tailbone in that gentle arch as that joint is between your tailbone and the sacrum. It is minute. It's a little nod backward with your tailbone and then a little nod exhale, a little nod forward with your pubic bone, really small. You're just nodding in the arch and flatten direction, arch tailbone going down, exhale, flatten, pubic bone coming up, just the very gentlest. You might even want to touch your pubic bones and feel it's the very, very gentlest nodding of your arch and flatten. And you are now, if you've, if you've followed that line, you are now nodding in arch and flatten the pubic band, the lowest band, and rest. You may feel highlighted through the pubic band, pelvic floor, groin area, tops of thighs. Okay, let's take your fingers and uh, bring them to the center of the pubic bone. At, well, one hand there and one hand on your belly button, your navel, go halfway between your pubic bone and your navel and bring your hands in the center there. This is the center of the inguinal band. It's about halfway between your pubic bones and your navel. And you're going to come laterally and you're going to hit your uh, ilium bones, your, your hip bones, and you're going to come up a little bit. You'll feel your hip pointers 
good hands are going to come laterally and possibly a little bit up to your hip pointers and uh, and keep palpating around your iliac crest to the extent that it is comfortable for your shoulders and your hands to get there you don't have to go all the way to the back but this inguinal band starts between the navel and the pubic bone comes across to the hip pointers the as is is comes around the iliac crest it's great to palpate the iliac crest and it's going to end up one of your hands may be able to do this or you visualize the top of the sacrum and the bottom of the lumbar it's a little below your waist. It's about an inch. The actual lumbar sacral junction is a little bit on most people below their waist and is often the center of their low back pain. Now, we're going to aim, if you bring one hand to the front of the inguinal between your navel and your pubic and your other hand, if you can reach it at the top of the sacrum bottom of the lumbar, just to begin your arch and flatten. You're, you're going to see if you can arch only into the, that junction and not higher. It's a very low arch. It's not very big. If it's confusing to have your hands there, take your hands away. So your arch is only going as high as the top of your sacrum. And then you're flatten the, the, the deepest part Gent of your gentle flatten is, is on that line between your pubic bone and your navel. So it's not a large arch and flatten, but it's a little bit bigger than your pubic arch and flatten. And you're just trying to rock gently between your top of your sacrum, bottom of your lumbar, and your center inguinal point so it's just a it's a just it's a bigger rock than pubic but it's still more a rock than a like a full arch and flat and rest for a moment okay <clears throat> let's palpate the um, navel or umbilical or solar plexus uh, band um, umbilical or navel is what it's usually called. Okay, let's start with our fingers in our navel. And bring your hands, each hand laterally, you'll brush the tops of your, of your iliac crest, you'll brush the tops of the iliac crest, so your navel band bleeds into your in inguinal band, and you come around, and now you're right at the top of the inguinal band. The bottom of the umbilical band is the top of the inguinal band. Now, the, come, bring your hands back to your navel. Now, your, your navel band can actually start where your umbilical band was in the front, one to two inches below your navel. It doesn't have to start at your navel. Many people have their band of restriction is the inguinal band more than the navel band. However, bring your fingers vertically up through your navel up to your xiphoid process or the lowest part of your sternum, the lowest part of your uh, ribs in the middle. Your um, navel or umbilical band can go that high. And if you let your hands go laterally along not just the border of the lower ribs, but even on to the bottom of the lower ribs, the border and the bottom of the lower ribs. It's where your respiratory diaphragm it is, is attaching underneath all the way to the back point. The back point is where your the bottom of your thoracic spine, the top of your lumbar, lumbar one, thoracic 12. So if, if you can either visualize that point or leave a hand there and then bring an, your other hand either to your navel or maybe halfway between your navel and your xiphoid process, the lowest part of the breastbone, you might even guess where your um, um, umbilical band might be. I'm gonna come a little bit more towards my solar plexus. That's where I perceive mine is a little tighter. 
But sometimes I think, no, maybe it is my navel. So the two points in the front of the back, now we're going to arch and flatten between these two points. So as you inhale and arch, you want to aim your arch to thoracic 12 lumbar one. You want to try to get it right to that point. And then as you come out of that and rock forward, you want to bring your pubic bone directed up to where you think your navel band is. I'm going to bring my pubic bone more up to my solar plexus, which I perceive as halfway between my navel and my xiphoid process. And I am going to now do my rocking arch and flatten between thoracic 12 lumbar one and my navel solar plexus. And to help me get into the flatten, I'm directing my pubic bone into my navel umbilical solar plexus band. We all have to kind of play with this and work it out. I am totally open to suggestions and comments uh, of how to proceed with these horizontal bands. These are new to me too. Okay, and relax for just a moment. Whew. Okay, let's go to the nipple or chest band. <clears throat> so if you bring your fingers of both hands on your sternum between your breasts at about your nipple line, some of us have to think of our nipple line when we were a little younger. Um, you can actually come under, if you're a woman, come under, well, if you're a man too, come under your breasts if you can, and see if you can find the rib space that's as close to and under the nipple line as possible, it can be very tender. So you're maybe between ribs five and six or six and seven. It doesn't really matter. If it's too tender, go down a little bit. This is an area of a huge amount of tenderness. There's a lot of lymphatics in here. And in fact, in lymphatic work, we go through, when I've taken lymphatic courses, we go through all the intercostals. Um, we, we, we gently massage between all the ribs and this chest band is particularly tender on so many people, they can't even touch it. But if you gently massage between your intercostals, wherever you feel tenderness, over a little bit of time, the tenderness will get less and less and less. And miraculous things can happen with problems in this, in this area, even through the body, like to the liver, to the lungs. Okay, so, and your chest band, I got, I got, I started massaging myself, I'm sorry, intercostally, comes around to the sides of the, of the rib cage, and this is where you're going to go to the dorsal hinge. You may not be able to get there, but let's visualize your dorsal hinge is on your spine between your shoulder blades, approximately in the middle of your shoulder blades. They often say T6, but it can vary T5, T6, T7. And so the end point is about, let's say T6 or in the middle of your shoulder blades on your spine. So let's do an arch and flatten as you arch. See if you, and you might have to change your head. You might have to start using your hands behind your head to direct your arch a little bit better into the dorsal hinge. I find as I'm sitting here doing it, I wanna bring my hands behind my head now so that I can, I can use my elbows going back a little bit as I arch and my head going back a little bit to get between my shoulder blades. You'll have to discuss discover that for yourself. So I'm at the dorsal hinge. And then as I flatten, I'm going to bring my elbows around towards the sides of my head, a little closer to each other. And I'm going to try to make a very high indentation. It's not that I'm not contracting the rest of my rectus abdominis, but I'm trying to focus right into the chest line. What I have found, then I come back into a dorsal hinge arch. If you leave your elbows out instead of on the, on, the, on the curl, instead of bringing them in, 
if you leave, if you curl, but bring, leave your elbows out, you might get closer to that line. It might be a little lower than the chest line, but you'll get a little closer to that line. You'll feel that line maybe more clearly. So there's advantages to leaving your elbows out and having your elbows come in on the curl. If you come in on the curl, you're squeezing and narrowing your, your breast line, your chest line. And then when you go into the arch, you're opening up the chest line. And uh, I usually end on a curl to leave my back long, come down, relax. And just give yourself a moment. One can keep going up, figure out how would you organize the collarbone arch and flatten or arch and curl and the chin line arch and chin band arch and flatten arch and curl and even the eye band. But we're going to stop there. And we're going to move into a breathing activity to get into all of the bands and I uh, so just give, uh, let yourself be quiet for a moment. I need to explain the grid you're going to draw on in your trunk. And I want to give credit to Kelly Peacock for some of this idea with the quadrants and to Pat Howe for the idea of a, a ball. We're going to be an in, internal deflated, inflated ball we're going to be using. So if you bring your hands along your collarbone, just just let them go from medial to lateral and then your pubic bone from medial to lateral that's the upper and lower edges of your let's say of your trunk and then draw a line down your midline okay and now we're going to we're going to create um three sections in our trunk the our uh, nipple or chest band and you might want to draw that coming from your sternum through your nipple breasts and around. That's going to all the way around three dimensionally that those are going to be the left and right upper quadrants. And then if you draw a line um, about at the um, inguinal line, which is uh, between your navel and your pubic bone, and you bring that line all the way around between your umbilical line and your chest line, you have a right and left middle section of your trunk. And then the lowest abdominal section is from your inguinal line, which is between your navel and your pubic bone and your pubic bone or your pubic bone area across lowest, lowest abdominal area. That's going to be your lower abdominal left and right quadrants. We're going to start in our lower right quadrant, the lowest line. And you're going to, in your imagination, take a semi deflated ball and put it into your lower right quadrant three dimensionally so that the potential of inflating the ball will come towards the front of your body, towards the back of your body and towards the side of your body. It's going to fit in that quadrant and it starts relatively deflated. You can take your right hand and put it on the lower right quadrant and breathe into that ball as three dimensionally as you can and inflate your ball comfortably. It doesn't have to be super inflated. And then as you exhale, it'll deflate. And as you continue to comfortably breathe, when you inflate it, your, your often awareness is drawn towards your front hand in the front, but see if you can also inflate the ball to the back, even into the lateral sides. And as you exhale, deflate it. See if you can three-dimensionally inflate the lower right front backside quadrant. And take a little momentary break and bring your right hand half on your lower right ribs and half on your right belly. So my hand is half on my lower ribs on the right, half on my belly, my fingers are not crossing midline. And now I'm moving the ball up into this middle area, right quadrant. And 
as I, and it's a bit deflated, as I inhale the ball three-dimensionally, that middle quadrant, front, back, sides maybe is a little hard. I can get front and back a little easier. I can inflate the ball as I inhale three-dimensionally, front and back. And as I exhale, it'll deflate. I can even bring my hand uh, or, or, or the backs of my fingers are more comfortable to the sides where I'm still on lower ribs with a little bit of flesh in there. And I can, I can laterally bend to the left. Remember this is the right quadrant. I can hip hike or laterally bend left. That opens up my right quadrant a little bit, my right middle quadrant as I inflate the ball. I can push the ball out laterally and broaden my right side. And as I exhale and deflate the ball, the, my, that area comes back to a neutral and I can hip hike left, inflate right, and slowly exhale, deflate. I found this really a good way to get into all the quadrants and go through all the horizontal, well, most of the horizontal, maybe not all the horizontal bends, but most of the horizontal bends. And then bring your hand, if you can, to your upper right quadrant. And now you're gonna put your semi-deflated ball into your upper right quadrant three-dimensionally. As you inhale, your upper right quadrant, front, back, sides, armpit, inflates. And as you exhale, it gently deflates a bit. It doesn't have to deflate all the way and it doesn't have to inflate all the way. You can even bring your hand down if you'd rather just visualize the ball in that upper right quadrant, inflating to the front, to the back, to the sides under the armpit. And as you breathe, that ball inflates three-dimensionally, de deflates three-dimensionally, learning in the process how to breathe three-dimensionally, not just in the front, which is not full breathing. And then let yourself rest for just a moment and feel the difference between your right trunk and your left trunk. And maybe it's all in me going up into my head and neck. We're getting towards the end of class, but we're gonna do the other quadrant if you have a moment to go over. And now your left hand can go on your lower left quadrant, lower abdominal area. And you're going to bring that semi deflated ball into that lower left quadrant. And as you inhale, you'll inflate that ball towards the front, towards the back, towards the side. And as you exhale, it'll semi deflate. You'll do that inhaling, inflating, def exhaling, deflating. And we're going to need to move on. So when you finish your deflation that you're on, bring your left hand half on your lower ribs, half on your belly. As you inflate the ball, front, sides, and back, three-dimensional breathing through that middle left quadrant, front, back, and sides. Sometimes I take my hand away if my hand is bringing my attention too much to the front of the quadrant and I'm not getting the back. You can put your fingers, I put the back of my hand, it's easier for me to reach on that middle quadrant on the side of the ribs. I hip hike right as I inflate that ball I get more out laterally, and as I deflate it, I narrow. When I hip hike right, I can inflate the, the left. As I come out of the hip hiking, I narrow. If I hip hike on the, uh, come out on the right, I deflate on the left, and my ribs can narrow. So I can breathe and I can widen and narrow my rib cage, not only breathe to the front and the back, but I can widen and narrow. And now I can take a breath through that whole middle quadrant, front, back, and sides more fully.
complete the deflation you're on. Bring your hand to your upper left quadrant or just visualize the upper left quadrant. It's up to you. Inflate, gently inflate into your upper left quadrant, front armpit sides and back and deflate. Sometimes you have to inflate less and deflate less to get the three-dimensional kind of pulsing rhythm going on of inflation, deflation. To play with these breathing activities, you wanna to learn to breathe three-dimensionally. We are working through all the horizontals from the collarbone through this whole breathing exercise from the collar band to the pubic band, but it'll bleed up into the head, neck, chin, and eye if you allow your face to relax as you breathe into this upper left quadrant, jaw relaxed, neck relaxed, and come to rest. Find a position of rest. Feel your left quadrant now, the whole up and down. Feel the whole left and right, all six quadrants, left and right. Full breathing, full breathing moves all the quadrants three-dimensionally. Jaws relaxed, eyes are relaxed, ears are relaxed, scalp is relaxed, arms and legs are relaxed. Notice your fullness, notice your length. We briefly at the beginning of lying down, we noticed the, our length in the back through the spine, in the front pubic bone, all the way up to the crown of the head, length in the arms, length in the legs, however your legs are positioned. Fullness of the back is more of your back as your as your chest broadens in the front and upper back in the back, as your, pelv as your pelvis broadens in the front and in the back of the pelvis, as your center, somatic center, sort of solar plexus area, as it relaxes, it both broadens, widens, and lengthens. When you lengthen well, you broaden. When you broaden well, you lengthen. See if you notice changes in your stature, even lying down. I'm going to bring an official end to class. It's always, and I will stop the recording. I'll start it again for our discussion. It's always nice to um, walk around at the end of class. I won't officially make the walk part of the class but it's nice to walk around at the end of the class that helps you to integrate the movements you've been doing and maybe to feel the, the, your, full, your full stature. So I'm going to say goodbye for today. And